Welcome to the Unmasked Podcast, where we're unmasking compromisers, cowards, and wolves, showing you what biblical Christianity is not, so that you may better understand what it is. I'm your host, Tyler Long. This is my co-host, brother in Christ, Joey Durantz. And we just want to start by saying, make it clear for the audience, since there's been some confusion, Joey, that compromisers, cowards, and wolves are three distinct categories. Yeah, so we want to make it clear that those are for some reason, some people, not many, but a few, have felt that that's one category. That anybody that comes on this show uh, is, is either just amazingly awesome or a coward compromiser and a wolf all in one. And this is kind of one of the reasons why I was arguing for the Oxford comma. But <laughs> we, we could... <laughs> Internal joke here. Yeah, we, we could hash <laughs> yeah. that out later. Yeah. yeah but yeah, those are, those are three separate categories. And somebody might come on that, that might just be compromising in one area, but not necessarily be categorically a compromiser. Right. But what we're doing is we're showing what biblical Christianity is not, so that you may better understand what it is, like you just said. And so part of that is instructing, right? Um, we're, we're not... Not big fans here of, of a very um, common cultural stream within American evangelicalism that says we need to be with things like politics and right. and, and other er- other certain areas that are taboo in Christian culture. Even the word taboo, I think, is taboo in Christian culture. <laughs> but with those areas, they say just speak in such a way so that the careful listener can understand. But but that's not what Christians are supposed to do. What we're supposed to do, especially you know, me as a pastor and, and teachers, and the, when we're teaching one another, we're supposed to make wise the simple with the scripture and the application thereof. Right. I, I speak in a way so that only the careful listener can understand when I'm at home, talking to my wife in front of my kids, and I don't want my kids to figure out what I'm saying to my wife, and so right. her and I will talk on a different level yep. without using yep. names right. so that my kids are oblivious to what's being discussed. But within the church, we, we need to be speaking in such a way that, that is pointed, that is direct, and, and that is bringing the truth to bear. I mean, that's what we see in 1 Corinthians 13. Love rejoices in the truth. Right. You would only speak in an a indirect way to protect a certain group of people from that truth, yeah. like you said in your example, right? So we should try to eliminate the escape hatches that sinful man will find. Right? Our sinful heart will always try to find the escape hatch. So the less specific we are as leaders and Bible teachers in our critiques, uh, the less effective our message is going to be, right? Yeah. And so you could say all day long, here's the things you need to look for in a pastor that are good, and here's the things that are bad. And somebody might still you know, be listening to like Joseph Prince or Stephen Furtick or something. It happens all the time. Right? And, and you go, whoa, whoa, wait a second. Didn't you hear this? Thing? Yeah, but they do this, this, and this, just like you said. You're like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Okay, well, let's, let's make it clear. And we should do this on the show, too. For a future episode, if somebody is a wolf, we'll, we'll make it clear, patently right. clear. Right. If somebody is, a, is being cowardly or is a coward, which is different, two different categories there. Right. We'll make that clear. Right. But yeah, we should say things like, Stephen Furtick is a wolf. Right. That, that's clear. <clears throat> right. So, for example, I think it was, wasn't it Rodney Howard Brown who, right at the beginning of the COVID uh, <laughs> shutdowns, <laughs> kept his church going full strength, which we would uh, obviously agree with. Not in that sense, because he's not he's a, a wolf. Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. He, he's, he's an absolute wolf, um, you know, feasting upon the souls of, of men. His, his appetite is his belly. So, he was courageous in that regard, but he's a wolf. Yeah, right? absolutely. Yeah, good. So this episode is going to be long overdue, a Q&A episode. We've had a number of communications uh, come to us with, with questions, clarity on certain topics, a lot of it related to church and state, of course, uh, but some uh, not related directly to that. General Christian living. <clears throat> yeah, and we've been uh, wanting to get to these things, but events have uh, you know, kept us uh, focusing on, on bigger issues at hand. Um, as well as, you know, church uh, needs that have kept us from recording. Yep. And, of course, church comes first. Uh, if, if, we, if we were putting the podcast before the life of the church, we would be undoing the ministry that we're trying to do with the podcast. Right. We're talking about yeah. the importance and supremacy of the local body. Amen. Right? Yeah. So, absolutely. So, just a quick update before we get into the Q&A. It, there's been a lot that's transpired uh, since our last recording. So... Um, I believe that James was still uh, in jail 
uh, at our last recording, James Coates, yeah. up there at Grace Life. Thankfully, he's been released. Sadly, the persecution has just diverted to other areas. And it's gone okay. from testing the pastor in terms of his fidelity. Okay, pastor, you're going to be tested. You can choose jail or you can choose um, obedience to us rather than obedience to Christ. Yeah. And so they erected a big barricade around Grace Life Church. They've manned it with armed police officers. And now they're taking that same test to the congregation, I believe, because they're basically saying, okay, your pastor's faithful. How faithful are you? What are you going to do, congregation? And the community, even around that area, from what I understand, is being just as harsh as a lot of the police. Oh, yeah. I spoke with one brother there that lost his job because of it, and, and, and some, some other people that are you know, experiencing some, some form of persecution in one manner or another. And it's just, yeah, it, it's, it's irksome to see, at the least. It, it's so sad, because even Canada, the whole, the whole West, you know, especially out here in the Americas, Canada, America, we've been so heavily influenced and founded upon so many Christian principles. Right. That the people don't understand that the worldview that they're attacking and the principles they're attacking are the very ones that undergird their freedoms. Right. And so the people are eating away their own freedom in a pursuit of freedom, right. under the banner of freedom. Right. And, it, and rather than what the community should be doing is rallying behind these people, like Grace Life and the other faithful churches, and helping support them and showing solidarity with them, even if you're not Christian. Right. The, 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 you, you can only have freedoms. You won't have freedom in a totalitarian, you know, statist nope. society. You're not going to have that. No, the exact same principles that we're using um, in regards to our arguments, the law of lesser, uh, the doctrine of lesser magistrates, the idea that all government uh, is, uh, gets its derived authority from God. That's where we also get our concept of inalienable rights. Yeah. Right? So if you try to separate the, the lawgiver from the law, you end up with tyranny. It's a natural uh, outcome. Yeah, that's why um, what's it, Samuel Rutherford, we were talking about this before we started recording the show. Samuel Rutherford was, and he wrote that book, Lex Rex, or that paper. Lex Rex, the law's king. And he, I mean, they were burning the books, they were banning the books, be, because what was before that? Rex Lex. The, no, 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 the king is law. And, and things were set up in such a way, it wasn't right, but it, it was because man's sinful tendencies would take over. And so anything the king would do was like the Pope ex cathedra. Mm -hmm. Anything he said was basically inscripturated in law. Right, right. So if he said, I, I want you all, all you peasants, to do this, to put your kids to bed at 5 p.m. and right. to jump on your right foot everywhere you go, they yeah. would have to do it. Most of them wouldn't. They would want to revolt. But what Samuel Rutherford did is says, no, 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 no. There's a higher authority, because you look, you're looking at Romans 13, every soul is to be in subjection. Yep. So then you have to ask the question, does the king have a soul? Not figuratively speaking, right? Does Caesar right. have a soul? Right. Uh, not like in the sense, you're so soulless, not, not in that pejorative sense, but actually, does he actually have a soul? Yet every living being, every living human has a soul. So then he's in subjection to, who's the authority that he's in subjection to? Well, first and foremost, the same one we all are, to God. But then secondly, he's, he's also in subjection to the people. Because if you don't have a people, you, you're not a king. Yeah. Adam wasn't born a king. Right. Adam, Adam was, was created and, and was born from God. And he was just a man. And he didn't become a husband until he had a wife. Right. And then he didn't become a father until he had a child. Right. And so we, we see that outworking of that even from the early stages of Scripture. No, you're right, and this is semi-related on the same topic, but I wanted to throw it out because I think it's important. Even those Christians who think, well, it's, it's for our health. That's, let's say for hypothetically that you buy the argument that it's as dangerous as they say it is. I don't for one second. But let's say hypothetically you do. By you even granting that um, authority to the government, you are stating, and this is the Trojan horse that's Im imported in with that, is that that's the proper purview of the state to make sure above all else that we are safe. Now, granted, they should protect us from evil, like crimes, murder, rape. Yep. That is uh, implicit in Romans 13, right? Or stated explicitly, excuse me. 
Um, but if they can justify their actions with safety, that is antithetical to liberty. Yep. Antithetical to liberty. Well, so they could justify anything, literally. So in the 1940s, they could, they could justifiably outlaw interracial marriage because you're likely to cause strife in this community. It could result in murder. And they'd be right. It will result in violence and murder. Yeah. Okay. So see how that's antithetical to liberty. It should be up to us as individuals outside of things ordained as evil by God to decide what our risk tolerance is within a certain, uh, you know, degree. Yeah. Right. It, well, part of that that plays into that is there's laziness. I mean, so mm-hmm. many people have been fed on the silver spoon of the government, and this is no accident. Right. That, that they've taken over schools and they've gotten the church out. You know, if you read through um, Christian Manifesto here by Francis Schaeffer, written decades ago, he, he, oh. he told us what was going to happen. Yep. And it happened. I mean, yeah. so much so that you, you'd be like, if you were a cessationist, you'd be going, man, is there still prophecy today? Because yeah, this yeah. guy seems like a prophet. <laughs> no, but in all seriousness, he, he lays it out. Humanism was deemed a religion. Yep. By the Supreme Court, and I think the '60s or something, or the thir- like third, like at some point between the '30s and the '60s, it was, it was deemed um, a religion, and because it has all the tenets of religion, everybody's religious to one aspect or another. What's your? Do you have a doctrine of God? Do you have a doctrine of man? Do you have a, a doctrine of ethics? All of those things play in to your worldview. Which White is, privilege. Yeah. Critical race yeah. theory. Yeah. Read through fault lines, and and yeah. Vody does a great job laying out the social justice religion. But, but everybody's been so silver, uh, on the silver spoon, so fed, spoon fed for so long, they've become lazy. And yeah. then instead of looking to their parents, looking to their community of faith, looking to themselves for self-discipline in these areas, ultimately, I mean, not, I'm talking non-Christians here. Yeah. They're looking to the state to fix the problems. Obviously, yeah. the first place we need to be going is looking at scripture. What does God's word say? Yeah. And, but the other part that has played into that is that pastors have not been functioning as pastors. No. There have been so many hirelings for so long just wanting to not rock the boat. Yep. Um, They're not the pillar in support of the truth. They are, I don't know, those climbing into the life raft or standing on the mezzanine. Yeah. I was, <laughs> I was recently complimented uh, by being called, um, being told I'm not a peacemaker. Yeah. And I said, and I was like, that's interesting because I, I do look at myself in some fashions as trying to make peace. And so I was like, I mean, and that's something that Jesus talks about in, you know, and uh, you can make five, peace nine. in areas where God has given you authority or liberty to make peace. Yeah. Not so in areas where he has declared war. I, yeah. I can't say to somebody, oh, you know, things are good with you and God, even though you haven't repented and you haven't put your yep. faith in his son. So I asked the person, what do you mean? And he said, um, you're, you're not a peace at all costs kind of guy. You're, you're more of a, a peace if possible, but truth at all costs kind of guy. I was like, oh, yeah. In other yeah, words, so a faithful little pastor. Th- yes. that's, that's what we should be doing. Absolutely. But, but playing back off of your thing, when, when, when we relegate things to um, like COVID as being evil or other, other pestilences and things, we have to have a proper a, a biblical theology of evil, a proper even systematic theology from the Bible of evil. And I think we talked about this before, but you have natural evil and you have moral evil. Yep. Natural evil, God straight out calls. What, what is that? Pestilence? What is that like you look at the plagues that he sends? Mm-hmm. God straight up calls that. He says in Isaiah, he said, I am, I am God and there is no other. I am the one uh, creating good and creating, most translations say calamity. Right. But the, translate, the word there is raw. It's evil. But it, it's not talking about moral <clears throat> evil. Right. It's not talking about moral evil at all. It's talking about catastrophes and right. calamities, and that's why they translate. It's a good translation. But that's not the state's purview. Right. And right. We, I think we mentioned even Texas. The Texas, when, when the natural disaster hit, everybody was like, won't you come help us in this? And they're like, that's, that's not our authority. That's outside of our purview. We don't do that. Right. You, right. you should do that. Your community can do that. A church around you can do that. But the government isn't supposed to come in and be your grandpa and right. help you with everything. No. Right. Right. And if it is done, it should be done on a local level. It should be neighbors loving neighbors, right? Yeah. And consequently, we're seeing this break apart. We're talking about updates. That's what we're supposed to be at, right? <laughs> at Grace Life, uh, we, ju- we just saw today that article that um, they're going to go ahead and go with the May 3rd court date, but Dina Henshaw yeah. isn't going to have to present a case 
of the of the evidence yeah. for the lockdowns. When it's like, whoa, 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 wait a second, hold on, you've got you've got a country in their, this province. You've you've got this shut down yeah. for for over a year now. Yeah. And you 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 should have evidence to back that up. Like you should be able to do that. In your, I should be able to wake you up while you're sleeping. And you say, what's the evidence for the lockdown? And you should be able to wake up and go, oh, this, 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 this. You should have it all. I mean, if it, you don't shut down a country before you have evidence. Right. You shut down if you have to because of the evidence. But I don't think you should in any way. But in, in, in any regard, right. this evidence needs to be... They're advancing the football towards tyranny. And people, it's happening and people just are oblivious to it and they blink and they don't even realize it's happening. So... As we laid out in the beginning, even with evidence, this is, you know, uncharted territory in, in terms of Western, you know, style democracies with the, the concept of, of natural rights, right? Where, you know, man, uh, you know, managing every aspect of our safety down to the viral level is a purview of government. That's new territory. So they've even moved from that to, okay, with evidence, that's our purview to now, we don't even have to show you evidence it's just our purview, period. Yeah. We don't even have to tell you or show you the evidence for why this is, is needed. And guess what they just came out with today? There's a third round of COVID vaccine you'll have to have, and it'll subsequently be followed up by a vaccine every year. Oh, of course, of course. If, if, you're, if your survival rate was less than 5% and they had a vaccine and said, hey, you know what, it's 70% with the vaccine. Right. I might do that. Right, right. But when your survival rate's over 99%, yeah. and, and right. the rate of the vaccine's less than that, you're like, <laughs> man, you're going the wrong way. Like, right. Why would you even do this? I've had people ask me, why, why won't you get the uh, COVID uh, vaccine? I was like, well, I've never in my life gotten a flu shot. Hasn't been worth the 15 minutes of my time in my risk analysis, so why would I get a COVID shot? But yeah. I mean, <laughs> especially when the COVID is actually resulting in a lot of adverse reactions. Yeah. I haven't heard about any of that with the flu shot. I'm not saying it doesn't exist, but... Um, anyway, so yeah, the Grace Life, uh, thankfully they are being faithful and they're meeting underground uh, right now. They met at an undisclosed location this past uh, Sunday and nothing is going to stop them, not Jason Kenney, not the Alberta Health Services or anyone else. The people that should be supporting and helping them. Yes, yeah. um, not the uh, uh, Royal Canadian Mountain Police or anyone else who should be interposing on their behalf. Nobody's going to tell them that they can't worship uh, God on the, on the Lord's day. So good for them. Um, prayers continue to go out for yeah. them. We, we were meeting underground this uh, whole summer. So not yeah. to say that we, uh, know what it's like to be fully under assault like they are, no. but in anticipation of what was to come. And since we could no longer meet where we were meeting, we made the same decision they, they did that not meeting isn't an option. So um, we've, those, we've met in a warehouse before. So. Yeah, those are sweet times. You know, you get the vents up top <laughs> going, and it almost sounds like a flock of seagulls. Seagulls, up there the seagulls. And everything. Oh, we missed yeah. that. Yeah. <laughs> the seagulls. Those were some sweet and precious times, though. They you know? were. They were. And I never thought I'd have to train the ushers to say, if the police come, yeah. do not let them in and unless you ask them, do you have a warrant signed by a judge? Yeah. Yeah, we had a whole plan ready because um, we didn't know how this was going to end. We've gotten more bold as time has gone on, uh, of course. But yeah, in the beginning, if somebody wanted to visit, we would vet them, make sure they're a real Christian, not just somebody because, you know, you had some people not respond to you um, when you when you asked them some questions. So because yeah. we were public online that we were meeting, but we were not disclosing the location. Yeah. Right. Because also because the person that, that owns the location, it wasn't like it was a place that could get shut down. Right. And could do a lot of damage also in that regard. Yeah. Whereas so, now where we're meeting, even though we haven't been abiding by the rules, unless well, they recently changed. I think. <laughs> so, so I think we are now. But, well, no, we're well, still not because oh, uh, not? I, I looked that up. So here's the current uh, I'll just say, rules. Finish, for, now, now that we're in a spot where it's not going to put anyone at adverse risk, we're just like, doors yeah. open, here's where we are. Come visit us. Doesn't matter who you are. Yes. And so. Right. Yeah. Exactly. We're more public about it because... Um, it's going to be a shared risk. Yeah. <laughs> so that's good. But um, short, long story short, Grace Life, uh, um, we appreciate uh, your faithfulness. Uh, there's some other churches up there that have uh, publicly stated they're open, so I'm not outing anybody. That's all on their social media. We've got uh, Grace Life Fellowship in uh, Lacrete, Alberta, Fairview Baptist Church in uh, Calgary, 
uh, of course. And then uh, remember that viral video from uh, that that pastor Polish Arthur pastor? Pulowski yeah. out of Calgary, where he told all the um, Nazis, yeah, yeah, the police and the health services that they were not welcome. Get out! I'm not even talking to you. You're Nazis. And I gotta say, I agree with his sentiment. So um, that's how it should be handled once they're there. Now. That doesn't mean that Grace Life was wrong to be generous and gracious. I think you should assume the best until they prove otherwise. But uh, the, uh, the RCMP proved unfaithful and, yeah. and duplicitous in regards to James and Grace Life. Grace Life was like the test case, it seems right. like. Right, yeah. And then this guy, no doubt, knew. Right. Arthur, no, Pastor Arthur, no doubt, knew what had happened. He was like, no, you're not going to come in here and do this. Here. Right. You're not going to do me like you did James. Yeah. Right. And we, we even see, you know, a, a change in approach with Grace Life. After the pastor was released and those those RCMP officers were trying to get in, and and those those ushers were deacons were outside saying no I'm sorry you, you can't unfortunately you can't because it's going to be disturbing the worship service under criminal code was it like one seven something mm-hmm. and and so they I mean they were still being respectful still saying no not going to happen but there's a difference there with Arthur because he I think he he grew up yeah, in communist, in communist Poland. Poland yeah and they're always the ones who get it. The people that have fled Cuba, the people that have come from Eastern Europe, I've got like they get neighbors. it. Neighbors, yeah, my neighbors yeah. are Ukrainian and Russian, and and they're just like, oh, we left to get away from this. We've got a doctor that that um, has family ties to South America, and mm-hmm. he's just like, and I asked him months and months ago, like, what's your view on this whole thing? Like, well, your professional opinion. He was like, if this wasn't an election year, none of this would have been happening. Oh, he yeah. said, this is the same thing that, that I've seen in South America. This is socialism trying to take over. And so they, like they, they all saw it. Yeah. But we here in America, we're just, we've been so trusting and the government's using that against us. Yes, that we th- we've been lulled to sleep because of our centuries long history of freedom and yeah. limited government that we don't think it's happening to us. When we're getting lied to, um, these tactics that are being used, safety, safety, are tried and true in every despotic country as that's soon ever as, existed. As soon as the Supreme Court set out and and did roe v wade it was you knew for you sh- we should have known for certain it's over mm-hmm, mm-hmm. because they're saying they're deeming a certain life that god has conferred value upon un- unvaluable yeah and there's and they've taken the place of god and done yeah. good government overreach and they've reached up and tried to pull god down from heaven and said no you even you need to submit to me yep euthanasia was a, another uh, yeah. uh, step in that direction and so, going back to your reference to Francis Schaeffer's book, that it was almost prophetic. If you really study the scriptures, though, um, and history, anyone can make these accurate projections. Because once you're on a track, it, there's, there's a destination where it inevitably goes, right? So, when, like when the, the sexual revolution was happening, and then the homosexual revolution. Like, 2020 and all of this transgender and LGBTQ radical... Uh, ideology that's come up this was foreseeable yeah every you're not a prophet you just know where this train leads right yeah and so similarly right now and we'll get into that in the Q&A but we know where this current church state train leads if we're not careful if you pick up the perspective of secular humanism which is the religion of the day Hmm. secular humanism who who is God you are yeah. You're, you're your own God. What is man? Mm-hmm. He, he's a clump of cells. Yep. You know, and that's why you have, they, they pick up on the Darwinian thing. That, I mean, we could go down that, that trail of Darwinism again. It's just so ridiculous because it doesn't answer any of the questions. It doesn't answer the question of origin. Origin's not even a scientific answer. It's a historical answer. So that's a category error. And just seeing everybody say, don't you trust science? No, I don't trust science. Science is, is a pseudonym now for a specific religion of secular humanism. That's what it is. Science, when they use it, the totalitarians, yeah. they mean do what our experts say. Science yeah. itself is just a methodology. Exactly. Right. It, yeah, it's not, and science doesn't say anything. Right. Evidence doesn't <laughs> say anything. Right. No, scientists say things. Right. And, and evidence is evaluated by scientists. Right. And man, it's just... And it's so amazing. Here, here's one thing I want to I want to try on some people when we do some evangelism, because you know they say you, you, if you say anything about masks or science, oh, are you an expert? Oh, well then, then I'm sorry, you shouldn't be saying anything. You get that whole thing. So I just want when I go talk to somebody like that and talk to them about the gospel and they try to tell me thoughts about God. Excuse me, are you an expert? Okay. Well, <laughs> actually, I don't mean to brag, but I 
I am an expert. Am in a sense. <laughs> By your definition of expert, I don't think I'm an expert. I know right. I'm still growing and got a long way to go. Right. But by your definition, I would be. So let me speak to you and let's just take it and just run with it. Yeah, right. Like, for example, um, I haven't, um, I'm not a sociologist um, who's done a lot of research in terms of, uh, you know, child um, abuse or, you know, uh, that sort of stuff, does that mean I can't speak against the immorality of, of child abuse? Or be able to tell what is and what isn't? Do you need to be an expert to talk about everything? No. No, absolutely not. I don't need to be a, a virologist to talk about the fact that it's immoral for the government to tell me whether I can meet with my family on Thanksgiving. That's immoral. Yeah. I don't need to know anything about viruses. I don't need to know, have any background in epidemiology or anything like that. So that's, that's a, a ruse that they use to get you to shut up. Like yep. people got to wise up to this, you know? Yep. So anyway, we've got some uh, great questions here that uh, we can get into. First and foremost, tying in with this theme that we've had uh, since episode one, the, the, the role of the church. Wait a second, we've got another update. We do. Oh, I Finland. forgot. I forgot about the Finland update. Yeah, so we've got to get the Finland update. Didn't want to keep uh, them out. Um, okay. I apologize, audience. So this is actually an important update because it's giving us a view that this isn't uh, just Alberta. Yeah. It's not just Edmonton. Okay, it's not just California. Um, you know, Grace Community Church is in lawsuits down there. This is everywhere. Um, and so, yes, in Finland, uh, two it pastors. Would be, excuse me. It would yeah. be more places for shorter amount of time, if every single faithful church opened their doors and said, hey, we're open. That's all it would take. If every faithful church across the world opened their doors and In stopped unison. bowing to the yep. emperor, right. then yeah, you know what's gonna happen? The government's gonna flex its muscles and we stay resolved, focused on Christ and obedience to him, and then, what, and then what's gonna happen? Right. Then they're gonna back down. Well, slight correction, because you know me, I'm more of a you know, blunt uh, object kind of guy. So I believe every faithful church is open. But <laughs> what, we, what we need is more faithful churches. Yeah, what we need, amen. Yes. And um, those, those that are on the borderline. Yeah. Okay, let, let, me, let me rephrase it. Those, those of you that, that would hold to the same gospel. There you go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Step up your, your level of faithfulness to faithful. Yeah. And then, and, and open up. You're and right. care for the people of God and go out and do evangelism. Yeah. Uh, have, have house gatherings where you're practicing one another's. Do potlucks, do fellowship meals, um, and, and go out and preach the gospel to people and, and gather together for church and sing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs and worship Christ and pray to, with one another and gather together. Ask free. Right, and that's... If, if, you're able, if you want, if you're able to. I mean, right. my point being, pastors, you can't mandate masks in the same way you can't mandate not wearing masks. You don't get to tell no. uh, your congregation what articles of clothing to wear. You, it's only Scripture speaks to, is it modest? Right, exactly. Right? Yeah. No, you're right. And so that's, that's our, that was our uh, goal for this, this podcast as we've been focused on the church-state issue. Um, you know, long-term, we're, of course, exp uh, dedicated to exposing compromisers, cowards and wolves, which isn't just on church-state, but that's the battle at hand. So that's why we've been uh, focused on this predominantly. But... Um, our, our hope is to encourage those on the fence to get off the fence. Because like you said, if everyone who holds to the true gospel were unified in this, this would end in short order. I mean, the Black Lives Matter movement is a testimony to how a loud vocal minority can sway, you know, the trajectory of a nation, right? Yeah. Now, Grant, I'm not going to you know, correspond them exactly. Obviously, they've got a sympathetic press and whatnot, but the, the power of the minority is seen in, in myriad examples. And so... Um, he gets, in uh, Francis Schaeffer's book, I think he goes over, there's the silent majority. And then he says, and within that, there's a, there's a majority and there's a minority within the silent majority. Right. And the majority, what they care about is just peace and possessions, essentially. I forget, that's not the exact terms he used, but essentially that's it. Yeah. I... I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to vote conservative, but I don't want to get involved in anything. I don't want to speak up. I don't want to cause any waves. I just want to keep peace and, and be able to keep building my castle. Right. 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 I want to be able, I don't want to be like, you know, Nehemiah. I don't want to build the wall with a sword and a trowel. I just want to be able to have two trowels in my hand, building my wall, not my wall, but my own castle for my own house. 
And then there's a minority in there that says, no, 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 actually, we need to love our neighbors. And we do need to speak up against these things. And it's not just enough that we vote conservative. We actually have to live a certain way and go out and, and garner um, you know, public support in these areas and take over certain public areas for the right. truth of Christ. Right, because unfortunately, courage is a scarce commodity, right? If, if it weren't scarce, it wouldn't be lauded so much. Cur right? Courage, yeah, courage is a virtue that, is, that we're supposed to have. Right, we are supposed to have it, but it's still Because if you're cowardly, rare. Yes. that's the first thing listed of the people that won't get into the new heavens and the new earth. Right, which means it's common. Yeah. Right? <laughs> um, which means it's unclean. Yes. <laughs> no, exactly. So if we're, we need to be that vocal minority within the majority, because I do believe even the majority in a place as uh, liberal as Canada, the majority are opposed to these draconian lockdowns. Now, of course, there's going to be some nuanced positions in there. But I think if you were to just ask everyone, you know, should they be, you know, limiting you to, you know, 15 people? you know, or 15% or whatever, most people would say, no, it's time that this stuff ends, right? And mm -hmm. I, I do think that that's the case in Washington as well um, and all over the United States. I mean, California, it's as liberal as it, as it gets. Why do you think Gavin Newsom's in a recall? Because they're done. Yeah. They're done with it. Because he was yeah. going out in public too much and he were, yeah. Jay Inslee's just hiding back. He's doing a good job of that. He's smarter. Yeah, <laughs> he's, he's more shrewd. Yeah. But yeah, in Finland, we gotta we gotta yeah, keep the brothers family. over there in prayer. There, there's um, so this I there, there's a, a brother of, of, of ours named Miska Wilhelmsen. He did a video. We'll try and post it uh, below. I'll, I'll link to it if you haven't seen it already. He's um, he's a pastor up there in Finland, and one of his kind of like sister churches that pastors that he's friends with that he knows personally. So this isn't like super far removed. I, I went to seminary with Miska, and so I know him well. He's a solid brother. But there's uh, two pastors, uh, Tommy Matika and Tuomas Tapila. They're, they're uh, pastors at Espo House Church. Yep. I think is how you say it in, in uh, <coughs> how you would translate the next word of the church. Um, they were arrested. They were meeting outside. They were gathering. Outside. They were gathering together outside because they couldn't. The restaurant they normally rent from uh, wasn't having people in, so they were, but they were gathered outside, and each family was socially distanced. So one family together, and then the next family. And even though, from what I understand, they don't even have to do those things, they were doing it. And the police came with masks, and and told them, no, you need to. Every single person needs to be two meters apart. And it's like, whoa, whoa wait. He's like, no, no, no. This is my my wife and my kids and everything. And he's like, no, they all have to be separated. And he's like, no, no, they don't. And so they. We thought they arrested them, but they just detained them. What they did is they took them away, brought them down to the jailhouse, put them in a cell, and kept them there for four and a half hours, and then let them out at the end of the day. Essentially, from what it sounds like, I'm not here to judge motives, but what happened was they weren't able to come back, gather together, and finish their worship service. Well, yeah, I think if they haul off your pastors in the middle of service, that that would probably render the service done. Yeah. yeah. Um, and this is, I mean, this is happening all it's, it's just popping up one place after another. That has absolutely nothing to do with health. That has nothing to do with uh, expert opinions about the spread of a virus. That has 100% to do with you are our subjects, you will do what we say, and if we say jump, you ask how high. Yep. Period. That's all that is. Yeah. There's no reason for power. families that are socially distanced and outside for the police to come and arrest their pastors. They're like, oh, you guys having fun? Watch this. I'm going to haul your pastors off. Like, they're trying to wage psychological warfare on you, on, on us people. Yeah. Like, that's what's happening. They, that's what the offenses are around Grace Life. Granted, they didn't want them to meet, but there's also a psychological warfare component to this. They Because Grace Life was the most visible church. Okay, visible church, check this out, right? Okay, you, oh, they could have uh, arrested these pastors on Monday. No, you know what? We're going to come over in the middle of your service, even though you're outdoors, we're going to arrest you. And they released them that same day, which some people say, oh, that's not that bad. No, that means they could have arrested them at any time. They made a point of arresting them during the service. Like, you got to understand uh, what the stakes are. The question is, okay, do you um, stare them down and, um, you know, stay faithful to Christ and, and give them due respect in all other areas, but at the same time say, no, I'm not bending on this. Yeah, and here, here's the thing that we have to keep in, in mind so we don't go, we don't end up copying their sin and showing spiritual solidarity with these wicked tyrants. 
as we're obeying Christ, which per is perceived as disobedience to them, but it's actually obedience to Christ, we need to be praying for these people. And here, we, we have to stop having fear of man. Because I can tell you, you know, we go out and we do evangelism. I try to do evangelism as often as we can. If you're afraid of talking to somebody, or if you're afraid of somebody that you might talk to or that comes and talks with you, what are you going to be thinking of? Self-preservation. Yeah. You're not going to be thinking of the gospel. Right. These people need the gospel. These people need to come to Christ. So yeah, maybe we can, after a long battle, convince them that what they're doing is wrong. At the end of the day, they're still going to hell. Right. And so we need to be praying for their salvation and bringing them the gospel. And so just like, you know, when somebody comes and they, they come and they talk to me and, and they'll, they'll say, oh, so you're a Christian? Oh, so what's your view on homosexuality? I, I, you <laughs> yeah. know what I do? I, I'm not going to answer that. You already know what it is. You just want to fight. I'm right. not here to just fight and argue with you. I'm here to proclaim Christ and right. his supremacy. So I'll go, hey, you know what? Uh, that, that's a good question. Uh, let's, I'll, I'll answer that in a second. But first, and go back to Christ, go back to the gospel. If we could grow in our evangelism and our apologetics and being able to redirect our conversations back to the gospel, mm -hmm. I, I think we'll see a much different approach in the years to come. It might take a while, but you know what? We might be sowing seeds now that our kids or our grandkids will be able to, to reap the fruit of. But we, we can't be afraid of these people our only fear should be our fear of God. Yeah, right. That's exactly right. No, I agree. Um, it's because the gospel's been uh, veiled by the church. Uh, it's taken a second place within the church. Uh, our mindset and popular uh, Christianity. Is... And that's stealing God's position again. It's yes. not the church's job to veil the gospel. If God <laughs> wants to veil the gospel to somebody, he has the prerogative, he has the right, he has the authority to do that. We don't. Right. We're supposed to just go and proclaim the whole gospel to yeah. all creation. And if he wants to veil it, he can. That's not up to us. No, exactly yeah. right. Exactly right. Um, so I, I suggest that we deal with this uh, one major question because it ties into exactly what we're talking about. Um, and that is this issue of the role of the church and why we meet and why mask mandates um, within the context of the church, well, outside too, but we're talking about the church right now. Why is this wrong? Why is this a hill worth dying on? That's, that's a question that we've heard uh, from a few different people, right? Because yeah. there's hills worth dying on, there's hills not worth dying on. Yeah, I, I think before we get there, there's one thing we've got to step back. And if you're a Christian, one thing you need to ask yourself, especially if you're a pastor, is what hills am I going to be willing to die on? You, you need to have... I mean, and it might shift over time as things shift around you and, and as you grow and you learn more. But if you don't have a set, these are the hills I'm willing to die on, one of two things is going to happen. You're going to die on every hill and you're going to relegate it to, well, this is truth. Uh, we have to, it's truth. It's for the truth. It's for the truth. And, and then you're going to just become annoying and obnoxious. Or you're not going to die on any hill. Yeah, one of the two. Right? And you're just going to compromise on everything. And you're right. going to find some special way to label it like peacemaking or... You know, I'm, I'm just, I'm just um, going the extra mile for the glory of Christ or something. But especially if you're a pastor, you can't go the extra mile with something that's not your own. The church isn't your own. You don't get to do that. Right. And so I think we need to start with that. But why is this a hill worth dying on? Because it goes back to authority. I mean, when we look at Colossians 1, Colossians 1, 18, he is also head of the body, the church, and he is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead so that he himself will come to have first place in everything. Mm. I mean, we read through Colossians 1 and we just see this beautiful, uh, it just lifts up the supremacy of Christ yeah. in all areas. And what we as Christians have failed to do is to actually live this out. So many Christians are like, you know, Sunday's my day. That's that, maybe Wednesdays, maybe a men's or a women's study, something like that, and that's it. But when we recognize, like we've been talking about, if you're a Christian... Romans 6 dis displays in no uncertain terms that you have died to sin, you've been you, you, you're now alive, and you're not a slave of sin anymore, and you can live for Christ. But all of that power and all of your ability to do that is by virtue of your union with Christ. Right. He gets into that here, he gets into that in Ephesians 1. It's our union with Christ. Right. And so then you have to ask the question, in what part of my life do I, am I not united to Christ? Right. And so 
making sure that we're living consistently as a Christian in every category of our lives. That, that would be another point that we need to start with. The other thing is, how do you determine what hill is a hill to die on? And I think it, it comes to when it affects the gospel, when it affects the testimony of the gospel, when it can do damage to individuals, especially within the church. Um, when, when we have a, a, a platform that, that God has sovereignly ordained for us to, to rise up and to speak. So like you see um, Paul in Acts 16 for a little while there, because it was just against him. He was like, I can, I can undergo this. I'll be arrested, I'll be beaten, and I'll use it as a testimony. Maybe he even knew that the jailer was there and that, that he, that guy needed to hear the gospel or something like that. Right. But when they went to send him away secretly, which was, seems like far worse than just than beating, you know? <laughs> right. If somebody was going to say, I can beat you or I can send you out of here, my choice would probably be, all right, send me out of here. Right, right. You know, just in right. my flesh, that's what I would want to do. But he said, he said, no. He was given a command, go, get out of here. And he said, no. But he can do that as an individual if he wants to. But the church doesn't belong to us. If I want to do that, remember we were talking about there's, there's those, those three options um, of, of uh, those, those three times we have to disobey. When the government commands something that God forbids, when the government forbids something God commands, or when they're out of their lane, when, when, when they're exercising authority they don't have. Right. And you use the example of, you know, if you get pulled over and they say, hey, I need you to come mow my lawn. You could do that if you want. You don't right. have to, but you could. Right. But if... If they pulls you over and he says, hey, I need your church to come mow my lawn. You don't get to answer for that. Right. You don't, you don't get to answer for that. And so we need to recognize it's the church. Right. That belongs to Christ. Right. And so we don't get to make the rules. And so going back to our why we must gather and all the reasons why we have to gather the one another's, it's commanded in scripture in no uncertain terms. Yep. Do not forsake the gathering. Why? Because in times like this where it's tough and when there is persecution, What's our inclination? Self-preservation. Yeah. Well, all the more so that we need the church. And, and uh, you know, the coming together, the building up of each other in our, uh, in our faith. Um, and so we need it in all times, but especially when we're tempted to, to gravitate towards self-preservation. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So if we're to maintain Christ as first, then of course we're going to obey his commandments. Right? It's commanded in scripture unambiguously. If you love me, you will obey my commandments. Right. Not if you love me, you will see my commandments as suggestions in times of great tr tr trial. <laughs> if you love me, you'll <laughs> lean toward my commandments. Yeah. No. Yeah. Right. And they're not burdensome. They're our joy. Right. Right. Exactly. And, and so it's absolutely a hell worth dying on. Um, so it's commanded, the uh, love requirements re requires it because we're to love each other. You can't do that if you're not together. Christian growth requires it, right? Uh, Ephesians 4.16, with the whole body being uh, fitted together with each, uh, each part and each joint yep. doing what, uh, what it was designed to do. Um, you know? And so it's clear from Scripture that uh, the Christian life is done in the context of local church with Christ at the head, uh, unambiguous. But uh, secondly... The reason that this hill is worth dying on right now, as opposed to, because uh, we've called uh, people out by name, right? So why is that worth doing? Well, it's worth doing because we know where this leads. We were talking earlier about Francis Schaeffer and how prophetic his book was about the battles that we're fighting. And so if you have a naturalistic, um, humanistic worldview that thinks we all came from nothing, yeah, there might be remnants of Christian thought that maintain, you know, the, the freedoms and, you know, stability of society for a while. But this train is moving, and it's going to lead to a devastating place unless it's changed, right? And so similarly, right now, we know where this is leading if we do not draw the lines clearly in ink right now, okay? So if it's established that the government is good and right and that this is fully under their authority— to, to dictate the terms of our worship and how many people can meet, okay? And that disobeying go the government in this regard is sin, the natural conclusion that we'll, uh, we will arrive at someday as the pressure increases is that Christians are going to call the authorities on other Christians and Christians are going to end up getting imprisoned at the hands of other Christians. Yeah, I, I think a question to maybe ask this, this, this person or those that ask this question is... Um, 
If your friend came to you and said, hey, you, you need to stop going to church. If a child came to you, so someone you're equal, someone, you know, someone your subordinate came to you and said, I need you to stop doing this. Um, because there's a lot of people that don't wash their hands. Well, how do you know that? Because there's a lot of people there. And whenever you get a lot of people, there's going to be bound to be increasing your risk of people that don't wash their hands or whatever. Right. But they say there, there's risks in, involved in you being in gatherings, so you shouldn't go. How would you take that like this, to this individual? How, how right. would, you, would you say, oh, yeah, you're right. Is there a difference because it's coming from an authority? Because we do have... We don't know how to do logic, and one of the one of the best arguments that people use today is actually a logical fallacy, which is appeal to authority. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they, they don't even argue things; they just say, "Oh, it comes from an authority, therefore it must be true." Happens all the time. And so then you have to ask, for what is the epistemology that this individual has, or this set of individuals that are dictating these things? For those of you at home, epistemology is uh, how you arrive at your truth. Yeah, is your source, your, your understanding. Yeah. From, from believing, from knowing. Um, so, yeah, how, what, what does this, where's this person, what do they think about God? What do they, where do they find out what's right and what's wrong? Because mm -hmm. here's the thing that we've been talking about a lot that I'm sure all of you have heard and that we keep hearing. Why won't you just love your neighbor? I'm all for loving my neighbor. Absolutely. Should I love to love my neighbor by yeah. God's grace. What is loving my neighbor? Who gets to tell me that? So if the state says, hey, we need to do these things, and then some liberal church jumps along and says, yes, we need to love our neighbor, according to what standard? Right. According to what standard do I love my neighbor? According to the biblical standard? And so then if it's, okay, how do I best love my neighbor? What's one of the best ways I can love my neighbor? By preaching them the gospel. Yeah. Well, doesn't this hinder your witness? No, it shows that I have something that transcends even this earth. Something I'm willing to die for, something I'm willing to go to jail for. This was some, this, Christians have been doing this since the beginning. Yeah. Since the book of Acts and all the way through church history. People would say, why don't you just, do, why don't you just offer a, a pinch to, you know, a pinch to Caesar. I was just reading through something. Uh, they, they were talking about how Christians weren't persecuted in the early church. And the times when they were, it was a religious thing. It had nothing to do with the state. And it's like, Really? Who killed them? Did, did you know they were tried as criminals? Right. For, for being rebellious right. to the state. Right. Because the state said, hey, here's what you need to do. Right. And so it's, it's, not, it's not unfounded for us. It's not unbiblical. It's not unhistorical for us to continue to do what we, we're doing. The sad fact is people are allowing the state to dictate to them what loving your neighbor looks like. And so many of these liberal churches yeah. are jumping on board. Yeah. No, and, and I think those uh, faithful, using your own faithful, even believers who are from a gospel-centered church, get it off because we always have these ideas in our head that when we suffer persecution, it's going to be you know, somewhat noble. Like, it's going to be for the gospel. They're going to say, I hate your gospel, and so I'm going to persecute yeah. you. But that's not the case. You're always slandered because of his name, right? So they're going to say all sorts of wicked things about you. They're not going to say it's because of your gospel. They're going to say, like in the Roman times, it's because you're godless, right? Yeah. They're going to say in these times, it's because you're spreading a virus. The super spreader. Right, exactly. Um, they're always going to come at you from an area that will deny you, because guess what? Satan's smart. It's going to deny you the glory that you seek, but the same consequences. Yeah, I, I think, um, man. Well, and that's why people, you know, I think in their minds default to, well, maybe this isn't persecution because they're not, they're not pointing the finger to me as a Christian directly. They're pointing the finger to me in another area. It, it could be. There's some smoke, smokes and shadows going on. I think one thing that's helpful that you, you pointed out, too often people today look at, they, they, they get time mixed up. It's kind of like an anachronistic fallacy. When we read something in history, we read it through a certain lens and we go, wow, that's awesome and that's noble and everything. But right. during that time period, that's not how the peers of that individual looked upon them. Right. And so when we're looking at things today, we, we tend to look at things, we collectively as humans, we tend to look at things and say, I'm looking for that experience that I read about in that book 
And so I want, if I don't see it here, then I can't follow through with it. Right. But that's different. It may, maybe you will. I mean, I have no doubt that should the Lord tarry, there's going to be a church history book and James Coates and, and the other faithful pastors in Canada are going to be in it, and rightfully so. Yeah. And it's yeah. going to picture them in the way that it should picture them, not in the way the state is slandering them. Right. And, and other people are. But that, I think that's a problem. We're looking for, for this because yeah. that's how we saw it in the history book. Right, yeah, that's that's what I was getting at. That People glorified. think like if you're going to suffer, you're going to get the same accolades from your contemporaries as the future is going to look at you. That's not the that's not the way. Yeah. Right? I mean, you wouldn't be suffering otherwise because right. they'd, they'd all love you and they'd all go. Oh, and I think Charles Spurgeon had a, a quote in that regard. Like everybody loves the uh, you know to look back in history at the the fighting bear, um, but time has him caged. Right, so like when you're looking back to Luther, oh. he's like a grizzly bear, and it's really cool in the cage. But they hate the bear that's unleashed in their time, yeah. causing all sorts of mayhem, right? And so even Charles Spurgeon, he was not a you know a popular guy among uh, the Baptist churches in no. in England at this time. Spurgeon was hated, hated, and they had slandered all the time because right. he was faithful. Right. Yeah, and he has that other another great quote: "Bold-hearted men are always called mean-spirited by cowards." Yes, exactly. Because that, that's, those are the things that happen to him. Those are the things that happen throughout history. And so I think one thing that you have to do is turn off your news, yep. pick up your Bible, and start listening to faithful churches, listening to their pastors and what they're preaching. Find out what their authority is. I, oh, man, we heard this sermon the other day, and he was talking about, all right, we're going we're gonna to start to open things up more because I think we've got herd immunity. That's not, that's not supremacy of Christ's argument right there. That's not saying Christ is the head, so then therefore the first place I need to go is not CNN, not MSNBC, not Fox News. The first place I need to go is to his word, to scripture. What does God command of me? First, as an image bearer, and second, and even more importantly, as a redeemed individual. Right. right. Who, I, I, my body's not my own, I've been bought with a price. How am I supposed to live in light of a holy God? What's the first and greatest commandment? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Right. The second is like unto it, love your neighbor as yourself. See, right. we've been set free by Christ. It doesn't mean we have everything together. It doesn't mean that we know everything. We're still growing. But we've been set free from sin, from its captivity. We don't have to, we're not, we don't have to sin anymore, whereas before right. we, we had to sin. But because of Christ now, we've been set free. And so what I want most for my neighbors is I want for them to be set free. Yeah. Yeah. And so like that example you gave of that church because they have heard a meaning, you can do the right thing for the wrong motive. Yeah. Right. And, and God will still judge you for that. Um, and so when you say we're going to open up the church because we have heard immunity, I'm sorry, that's the wrong motive. Right. That's why man is incapable of good. It doesn't mean that man is, is incapable of doing good uh, horizontally. Right. It means, you know, you can feed a homeless person as a non-believer, but you're doing it yeah. for your own glory, not for the glory of God. And your motive makes it wrong. And so that pastor who's saying, you know, we can open up because we have herd immunity or anything like this, trying to justify it in any other realm other than this is what Christ commands and we're a church and we're going to be faithful. Y your foundation is sand, right? Yeah, and, absolutely. Yeah. So... Um, this is I, absolutely a hill to die on. Yes. This is for the, the supremacy of Christ over His church, the purity of the, of the church. When you read through the Bible, one of the things that you understand is there's spheres of authority. Um, I think if you listen back through all of our episodes and start at the beginning and walk through, I think it'd become a lot more clear. Um, yeah. Listen to some of James Coates' sermons, read some good books, yep. um, read Lesser Magistrates, read Magdeburg Confession, read um, Vindicia Contra Tyrannos, read Lex Rex. Read Theodore Beza on the subject. Read uh, Christopher Goodman on the subject. But you've got spheres of authority. And so I, I, I don't think that, that I think, would, would you be okay saying this is a hill to die on if I came over to your house and, and came and just made, made myself up a, a little bed in your living room and started telling you and your kids and your family what to do and when to do it? I mean, not anything like super degrading or anything. I'm not talking about that. I'm just saying like, hey, now it's time for you to, to go to bed. Now it's time for you to put this on instead of what you're wearing. Now it's time for you to, and started doing that. Would you say that that's okay? It, would, would getting me out of your house be a hill to die on for you? Right, right. It's because of what you're, uh, you're granting that person doesn't yeah. belong to them. They could tell you to go to bed at the same exact time that you planned on going to bed. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Right? Yeah. They could have you eat the meal that you had planned on eating. 
It doesn't matter. That's not your authority. This is not your realm. Get out of my house. Yeah, and so then and where, where we're going with this, obviously, is that the, there's a family sphere of authority. There's a state sphere of authority. There's a church sphere of authority. The state is trying to come over into God's house yep. and to say, now this is what you as God's children need to be doing. But right. they don't have that authority. Right. The authority that the state has has been given to them by God not to oppress God's people, yeah. but to encourage flourishing in God's people by punishing evil. Yes. And Amen. So it's Amen. a hill to die on. It is absolutely it's a, a hill, hill to die that. a thousand deaths on. Yes. <laughs> Next to social justice, it's the hill to die on right yeah, now. Yeah, these are and like... They're 1A and 1B right now. Oh, that reminds yeah. me of something else that I came across that was really stupid. <laughs> um, somebody, how many times have I heard this is the biggest um, threat to Christianity? I saw that. Yeah, yeah, I've heard this so many times, this and that, and it's like, probably because it is. Like, what, what, if, if you've got cancer, yeah. and you've got you know, pneumonia, and you've got all this other stuff going on, you're going to go, okay, what's the most dangerous? Let's take that out of the way. And then something else comes up. Oh, and then you get an infection in your foot. And it's like, well, what's the most dangerous? Like, it's yeah. not that these things aren't dangerous. Right. It's just that by God's grace, a handful of churches collectively have been fighting against it very well and preserving the purity of the church. Yeah. How many times did Israel hear that this uh, foreign nation was the greatest threat to Israel? Does that mean there was all a lie? <laughs> yeah. So I mean, come on. We yeah. we've got a we've got this is this uh, critical theory. Read Brody's book, Fault Lines. Yep. Um, you'll get a good introduction to it. And who's the authority of the church? Who is head of the church? Jesus Christ is head of the church. Caesar's not head of the church. How yeah. would you feel if the church? Let's flip it over. If the church started imposing, not Christians that have the the office of magistrate, but if the church started imposing certain sanctions and certain rules and certain laws on the government. What if, what if we, we came and said, you know, everybody throughout the state of Washington needs to practice foot washings? And this, you, would that be a hill to die on to say, no, 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 you've gone too far. You're, you're, you're out of your lane, you're out of your sphere, you're out of your authority right now, you can't do that. And so it absolutely is a hill worth dying on. Yeah, no, you're right. And, yeah, uh, listen back to our other episodes. Yeah, that's what I was going to say, because um, in order to do these uh, other questions uh, justice, I'm going to hold them off uh, till the next uh, episode, but uh, we'll cover them. Um, so we really Sounds answered good. the one question today. Is this a hill worth dying on? And that's the preeminent question on this issue. So yep. is this a hill worth dying on? But I see a lot of questions just in closing on our uh, YouTube page and stuff and through our emails that we've covered previously. And so I would encourage you, if you have questions on some of these things, to listen to all of our previous episodes because most of these uh, questions we've answered, uh, we've, we've covered this uh, issue from various different angles. Um, I know we're not the most entertaining folks in the world, but we have put a lot of research into it and we've built it uh, methodically. So if you want to know... If you want to know why this is um, another practical, more pragmatic also why this is a hill worth dying on, watch Satan's Recycled Devices. Yeah. Episode one and two, because yeah. what's happening to us right now is almost identical to what happened to Nazi Germany leading up to the takeover of Hitler. I know, it's ironic. I was most proud of those two episodes. They got the, the least lessons and views. But <laughs> you know, that's how it goes even when you're a pastor too. Sometimes you're like, man, that was a really good sermon. And people are like, thank you for your faithfulness. <laughs> and, and I then like one, those episodes. And then, they, and then I'll preach a sermon. And I'll be like, yeah. man, that was a train wreck. And then somebody was like, that was my favorite one yet. And I'm just like, all right. Well, Lord, you know what you're doing. Yeah. I'm thankful just to be used by you. <laughs> but we put a, a lot of research into those. And, and not that you should listen just because we worked hard. But there's actual um, really good cases in there for learning from the dangers of history yeah. that apply to this issue today. And so I'm saying it would be fruitful for you to go listen. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, so um, do that, and uh, we will continue to uh, uh, come at this issue from a biblical perspective, try to encourage the body of Christ in this regard. Uh, if you're in Finland, uh, if you're uh, up in Alberta, if you're in Washington or California uh, yeah. or Oregon, our prayers are with you. Uh, until then, there is no king but Christ. And be lovingly obedient. God bless you.
You need to weigh in on the cost factor and count the cost of being a disciple of Jesus Christ. It will cost you popularity. It will cost you promotion, perhaps, at times. It will cost you an easy life. You will have to discipline yourself. You will have to buffet your body. You will have to say no to temptation. You will have to say no to this world. You will have to break with the crowd. You will have to be willing to stand alone for Christ. You will have to be willing to walk to the beat of a different drummer and to to step out of the crowd even if no one follows after Jesus Christ. You'd be willing to stand if you're the only person in the world for Jesus Christ. That's the cost factor.